So, so David, thank, thank you for doing this. Uh, David Papke is a pathologist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, and one of his interests, one of his primary interests, if I'm not mistaken, David, is bone and soft tissue pathology. So, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what led you to bone and soft tissue pathology? Sure. Um, well, first, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, to talk here. I really appreciate that. So. Um, as you said, I'm a uh, pathologist here at Brigham Women's Hospital. I sign out GI and uh, bone and soft tissue pathology. What drew me to soft tissue, um, I think in particular, is the, the diagnostic challenge that many of the cases presents. Uh, there's a puzzle solving aspect to trying to get to a diagnosis, and I uh, really enjoy that process. And it's very satisfying when you can get to a diagnosis, um, particularly in a case where it's not um, that obvious when you first look at the H&E. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Um, I'm not going to try and put the other services uh, under the bus, but bone and soft tissue pathology is probably one of the most challenging services, and certainly something that certainly led me to bone and soft tissue pathology as well. Yeah, I was going to say that must have been one of the reasons why you went into it as well. Yeah, yeah, and you're in, you're at a great place with some superb, perhaps the most the most ex expertise on bone and soft tissue pathology that I know of in the world. So it's a great place to work in. I'm very lucky to have had good, good mentors here. That's yeah. for sure. All right. So we, what we were planning to do is to just discuss a few cases. And so I'll let you talk through them. And, you know, these are a couple of new entities that some of which David has had a major role in describing. Um, and so do you want to take it from here? Sure. I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right, yeah, so I'll just present um, a few cases here. And these are all tumor types I'll mention that I, I recently wrote about. Um, Bikram had asked me to, to write a review article uh, discussing some emerging entities. And uh, I was lucky to have a, uh, a talented trainee uh, at our institution, Emily Towery, who, who kindly agreed to do this with me. So these tumor types we'll discuss in a lot more detail in that article. If it's something that you're interested in, I would uh, encourage you to, to read this article. Um, so the first tumor here, this is a foot mass uh, in a 48-year-old male. Uh, you can see that this tumor is uh, growing through the dermis and the subcutis. Uh, it's a spindle cell neoplasm. On higher power, you can see that it has significant nuclear pleomorphism, um, but there's a paucity of mitotic activity. Actually, if you were to look around this tumor, it would be difficult to find any mitosis at all. Mm, I would have um, guessed that this is just a UPS. Well, it's funny you mention that because in the old days, that's what they were diagnosed as, is low-grade UPS. Um, but now we know a little bit better. So these tumors, um, just to point out a few of the features that are diagnostically helpful, um, you can see that there's lipidized cytoplasm. There are these bizarre and large nuclei, some of which have nuclear pseudo-inclusions. And some of the cells have uh, glassy eosinophilic cytoplasm. Uh, also, if we look around the tumor, you'll see that there are areas with these prominent foamy histiocytes, which is another useful diagnostic clue. Um, so this tumor is diffusely positive for CD34. It expresses keratins. This is a pitfall for the misdiagnosis of sarcomatoid carcinoma, although the lack of mitotic activity should give you pause in that regard. It also expressed uh, Desmond, which can happen in some of these tumors. And it's diffusely positive for CAD-M3. This is a cell adhesion molecule that's um, expressed by this tumor type. It's a specific and sensitive marker. So this is a superficial CD34 positive fibroblastic tumor. Um, this is a tumor type that was described for the first time in 2014. Um, I would say now I, I think it's a, a gained wide acceptance as a distinctive tumor type. Uh, these occur in the uh, skin and subcutis. About three quarters of cases uh, occur in the lower extremity. Um, these can very rarely give rise to regional lymph node metastases, but the patients who develop those metastases don't seem to develop any uh, additional metastatic disease. And uh, so far, there are no patients to date who develop distant um, metastatic disease. So these tumors um, can behave in a slightly uh, locally aggressive fashion, but generally speaking, they're pretty indolent. And in fact, most of them don't locally recur after resection. So despite their really pleomorphic and, you know, sometimes striking uh, uh, appearance, they actually behave in a relatively uh, indolent fashion. Uh, we now know about the genetics, which we discussed in this article. I don't want to go into too much detail here, but the, the take home is that um, because of some of the genetics of these tumors, uh, they overexpress the cell adhesion molecule um, in 95% of cases. And this is actually a specific 
uh, marker for this tumor type. So this is something we're using routinely now at Brigham. Oh, that's that's terrific, David. So just uh, two questions. One is, um, you know, what is, what what is the one feature that What's the tip off that you're dealing with this tumor and not a UPS? And <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, well, you know, for me, it's a combination of superficial location, nuclear pleomorphism, and paucity of mitotic activity. Okay, Those nice. three things combined really are pretty specific for this um, tumor type. The yes. glassy cytoplasm is also another very useful ah. diagnostic clue. And, and and is it the is it the function? I mean, we know that dermal and subcutaneous tumors tend sarcomas tend to do better. So is it a function of location or is it a function of biology, the good behavior? That's a very good question. And I, I think there probably is not a very good answer to that question right now. Um, these tumors can primarily occur in subcutaneous tissue as well. That's uncommon, but it can happen. So they're not all confined to the dermis. Um, many of the dermal tumors do invade subcutis as well. As you know, for other tumor types um, like uh, smooth muscle neoplasms of the skin, if, they're, if they show nuclear atypia and they invade subcutaneous tissue, then they acquire metastatic potential. Right. That is not the case for these superficial CD34 positive tumors. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question um, without a very good answer at this point, I would say. Okay, so case two. This is a paraspinal mass in a 49-year-old male. Uh, you can appreciate at low power that there's this vaguely lobular growth. It's pretty monomorphic. I'll show you one high power field. Basically, the whole tumor looks the same at high power. Can, can I just say that this is, I would call this endocrine tumor, endocrine tumor, and endocrine tumor. Yes. And I no, would throw really a synaptophysin and chromogranin at it and then repeat yeah. it because it's negative. So, um, yeah, that, that's exactly, uh, I'm glad to hear you say that because we thought they looked a lot like well differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, uh, which is how we name the tumor sort of in a way. But anyway, so this, this tumor is extremely monomorphic. Like a well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, it shows monomorphic round nuclei with speckled chromatin. The cells are epithelioid with uh, paleous and cytoplasm. They're growing in these nests and trabeculi, so it looks very much like a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. But uh, you throw your keratins on it, they're negative, um, which of course for a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, that's almost unheard of. That's very, very unusual. Right. Neuroendocrine markers are negative, so INSM1, synaptophysin, chromogranin are all negative. I will mention, we don't use CD56 here, but I have heard from outside pathologists that CD56 can be positive in this tumor type, so that is a potential pitfall if you're using that marker. But the useful marker in this tumor type, uh, as it turns out, is beta-catenin. You can see that it's diffusely positive in the nuclear. So as Vikram alluded to, these tumors look very endocrine, which is um, why we named this tumor type pseudoendocrine sarcoma. Um, so this is a tumor type that we described about a year ago now. And these tumors um, tend to occur in older adults. The median age is just over 60 years. And they have a striking predilection for paravertebral soft tissue. Almost all the cases occur in uh, paravertebral soft tissue, often with um, secondary involvement of vertebral bones. Um, these are locally destructive tumors. So with... Um, clinical follow-up, we, we've learned that these, despite their really bland appearance, they're actually sarcomas. They're locally aggressive, uh, about 40% recur locally, and as I mentioned, they can be destructive local recurrences. And about 20% of patients in our series develop lung metastases. So these, these tumors have metastatic potential, um, and so that's why we called them pseudoendocrine sarcoma. Just to show a few other images of these tumors, because they look very distinctive once, you, um, once you've seen a few. They show this extremely monomorphic growth, in a way even more monomorphic than you'd see in a typical well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. Right, it's a little too perfect. A little too perfect, exactly, yeah. And uh, you can see this tumor is growing in trabeculi and nests. Um, the salt and pepper chromatin is there, just like a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. Um, some features that you can see, about two-thirds of these tumors show pseudoglandular architecture, where you get these spaces that are uh, lined by, by tumor cells. Um, mimicking glands. About half of tumors show these extracellular uh, hyaline globules that we see here. It's another useful diagnostic clue. And about a third of cases show somomatous calcifications, um, which can be quite uh, prominent in, in some cases. So as you guessed by the IHC, these tumors harbor uh, beta-catenin gene alterations. 
uh, in all the cases that we sequenced, and we basically didn't find any other recurrent alterations. Ah, interesting. The, the take home with pseudoendocrine sarcoma is, uh, you know, you have a tumor that's occurring in paravertebral soft tissue that looks like a well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor but isn't staining right. You should think about this uh, tumor type. Oh, fantastic. That's uh, certainly will be on my radar. I do wonder if I've seen one and dismissed it as a chromogranin synaptophysin negative neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, yeah, gosh. Um, I, it's actually interesting. Once we published this study, we heard from several pathologists all around that said, oh, you know, I, I saw a case, I'm sure I saw a case, and I, I thought it was a well different neuroendocrine tumor, but I couldn't, you know, force it into that category. And yeah. Setting up, yeah, that's, that's what these are. All right, let's go to the next one. Sure. Fantastic. So this next case, this is a chest wall mass in a 13-year-old female. Um, you can appreciate uh, that it's a pleomorphic uh, sarcoma. So pleomorphic sarcomas are pretty uncommon in, in kids. And this tumor shows a mixture of epithelioid and spindle cell morphology. You can see these fascicles of uh, spindle cells and then these epithelioid cells in between. Uh, the tumor is brightly eosinophilic cytoplasm and pleomorphic um, hyperchromatic nuclei. So it looks a little myogenic because of the cytoplasm. Yes. It almost looks That's a right. little like yeah. an EHE as well, maybe vaguely. Uh, yeah. Epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. With the, yeah. With the stroma, yeah. Um, but yeah, so this tumor, like you said, it does look quite myoid. It's got this brightly eosinophilic cytoplasm. But it actually shows, in this particular case, somewhat limited desmond positivity. Mm. Um, a lot of these tumors actually have limited desmond positivity. So for most rhabdomyosarcoma subtypes, that would sort of take it off the table. Most rhabdomyosarcomas have diffuse Desmond expression. Yeah. But, but this rhabdomyosarcoma type actually um, often shows limited Desmond expression. That's actually a major pitfall for just not getting to the diagnosis. So you can see here, this tumor is expressing a nuclear myoD1. So it is a rhabdomyoblastic tumor. Um, this tumor expressed uh, keratin A1, A3, which is expressed in almost all cases of this tumor type. And it also shows diffuse elk expression, which is seen in about three quarters of these tumors. Um, but it does not harbor an elk rearrangement. Instead, it harbors a rearrangement in FUS. And so this tumor is a, uh, an emerging uh, type of rhabdomyosarcoma, uh, which is termed epithelioid and spindle cell rhabdomyosarcoma. So this tumor type was identified originally through uh, retrospective analysis of sequencing data, where it was found that there are these Rhabdomyosarcomas that harbor gene rearrangements involving PWSR1 and FUS on the one hand, and TFCP2 on the other. That's the constant um, uh, partner. And these tumors behave in a very aggressive fashion. Um, all the patients in this initial uh, series died within five months of diagnosis. That's borne out on subsequent series. So um, here, here's um, clinical data from a subsequent series. You can see that you know, most of these patients died of disease often within just a few months of initial diagnosis. These are very aggressive sarcomas. Um, they can occur across a wide age range. Um, they can occur in both bone and soft tissue sites, um, but they do have a predilection for occurring in craniofacial bones. And um, they have a pretty even split of rearrangements in FUS and EWSR1. At Brigham, if we're suspecting the diagnosis, we'll send it to, to fish for both of these um, genes because of this even split. And interestingly, they don't have elk rearrangements. Some of these tumors do have internal deletions in the elk gene, and they have very high levels of elk overexpression um, based on mRNA sequencing data. In fact, there's a recent report of a patient who responded very well to elk inhibitor therapy. Interesting. So this may actually present a therapeutic target for this tumor type. Um, but anyway, so the take home with this, if you have a pleomorphic epithelioid and spindle cell sarcoma, it's got some Desmond expression. You should think about throwing an A1A3 uh, an elk and a myoD1 on it, and, and that'll that'll get you to the diagnosis. So the hint sounds to me is you you go down the tr track of a, uh, myo a tumor with myogenic differentiation, but you just don't quite see the the level of Desmond expression that you're uh, anticipating. Would that be exactly. appropriate? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right, and. Um, you know, if I'm suspecting this diagnosis, uh, I'll run Desmond and um, MyoD1 up front, um, anticipating that often the Desmond will be quite limited. In fact, Desmond can even be negative in this tumor type. Uh, 
which is what, obviously what, what about for somebody you know say in the developing world who has no access to uh, fish or fusion would a this pattern of desmin myogenin uh, or myo d1 and alk expression be sufficient yes. to get yeah, the that, diagnosis that's right that, that is sufficient and um, we have we have made the diagnosis based on that, that combination of ihc markers at our institution before um, we have the luxury of having the EWS or one and FUS fish available, and because these are so rare, we like to, you know, get um, that that confirmation. But I think it's not um, strictly necessary if you have the right um, morphology and immunophenotype, uh, especially yeah. the elk. Uh, like you said, more limited desmin. And I can uh, talk about this last tumor type. So this is case four. This is a tongue tumor in a one-year-old male, and you can appreciate in this low power image that it's a strikingly lobulated tumor. There are these so lobular, lobular capillary hemangioma would be, at least that low power look is yeah. very much like that, yeah? But yeah, yeah, or um, I would say it's also analogous at low power to the growth pattern seen in glomus tumor and in myofibroma yeah. and myopericytoma, this, yeah. these, these lobular tumor cells, um, which you can see are separated by these uh, fibrous septa, um, which is a common feature in this tumor type. Within the lobules, you can see that the tumor is strikingly nested. There are these nests of pretty uniform neoplastic cells. They have uh, vesicular nuclei and small distinct nucleoli. And the, uh, the nests are separated by this delicate network of capillary channels, which is very typical in this tumor type. Another common feature, which is a, a helpful diagnostic clue is shown here. So um, this is a blood vessel. And you can see that there's a lobule of tumor cells that's bulging into the lumen of this vessel. But it's not actually lymphovascular invasion in the sense that this lobule is still surfaced by endothelium, um, but this is a perivascular uh, growth pattern that's seen in this tumor type. And of course, this growth pattern is also seen in tumors in the myofibroma, myoparasitoma, glomus tumor family as well. So, you know, you could think about a hemangioma, and you, but you'll see that CD31 highlights numerous blood vessels in the stroma, but is negative in the neoplastic cells. Uh, the neoplastic cells do express MDM2, Oh, gosh. Okay. But this doesn't look yeah. like a um, liposoc, so I think... That's right. Yeah, this is, this is too monomorphic, and um, yeah. also the you know, tongue of a one-year-old, the clinical context wouldn't, wouldn't fit well right. with a de-differentiated liposarcoma. Uh, and the tumor also expresses this marker, which we brought online here, GLEE1. And you can see with the GLEE1 stain, you can appreciate how uh, strikingly nested this tumor is. Um, and GLEE1 is showing nuclear and cytoplasmic That's expression. That's a beautiful stain. It works very well in our hands, yeah, which I'll, I'll discuss uh, just uh, briefly in a slide here. But so this is a tumor type that we described uh, recently under the rubric of nested glomoid neoplasm. Uh, this is a GLE1 altered tumor type. Um, they, they harbor GLE1 gene rearrangements and amplification. Um, and there, I don't want to get into the whole backstory here. I think it would take too much time. But if you check out this review article we discuss, um, there have been reports in the literature of sarcomas harboring GLE1 gene alterations um, and showing a, a wide range of morphologic uh, findings. So we decided to study a morphologically consistent um, set of tumors that have these GLE1 alterations. And we term these nested glomoid neoplasms. And these tumors actually behave in a relatively indolent fashion. So they can recur locally, often with pretty long intervals um, between the primary tumor and recurrence. But none of these tumors in our series metastasize. Um, we had pretty good long-term follow-up in, in uh, quite a few patients. And also, some of these tumors were present for a very long time before they were resected. Again, this isn't the behavior you'd expect from a sarcoma. Uh, none of these metastasized or behaved in a locally aggressive fashion. So these nested glomoid neoplasms show lobular architecture. The tumor lobules are separated by these uh, irregular thick fiber septa. And then within the lobules, they show uh, nested uh, growth, as you can see here. And on high power, you can see, again, they have these vesicular nuclei, these small distinct nucleoli. And actually, in a way, they also sort of resemble well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. You know, they have this very nested... Um, yeah, most, mo tumor. more so that than actually a glomus tumor. I assume in the past, were these called glomus tumors? Or what were That's they classified as? So these are these are mostly negative for SMA. So the, ah. the you know, phenotype wouldn't fit. Um, it's interesting. The low power architecture, that that lobular architecture with bulging into vascular lumina, that looks like a glomus tumor. But then this nested growth and 
uh, doesn't fit so well. Also, the tumor cells don't show distinct cell borders like you see. Yeah. In those there are some some differences more in the higher power architecture than in the low power architecture, which is why we describe these as glomoid, but they're not actually sort of glomus. Um, and, and these are negative oh, for chromosynapto and things like that. That's right. Although they can sometimes express keratins. That, that's a that's okay. a diagnostic pitfall for well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. Or if these occur in the skin, that can be a pitfall for misdiagnosing an adaxial tumor. Because many of us have no access to GLE one IHC, so uh, I'm that, just thinking in terms of um, uh, you know, um, so it is a very so, distinctive. Did, did, was there much variation in the histologic uh, between cases? Or did they all look they're like this? They're relatively uniform. Some of them had clear cell features, um, which made them look a little different in some cases. But for, for the most part, um, they were pretty uniform. One marker that can be helpful is about a third of these express S100. Uh -huh. um, they don't express SOX10, though. So if you get some S100 positivity, that can support the diagnosis. Uh, if you have access to um, DDIT3 fish, um, that actually can pick up the gene rearrangements because DDIT3 is right next to GLE1 in the genome. Oh, um, MDM2 fish can pick up, MDM2 is often co-amplified, which is part of why it's expressed in these tumors. Uh, um, so MDM2 fish can also be used to uh, support the diagnosis. But um, I'll grant that this may be a hard one to, to diagnose with an objective marker right. um, you know, if you're in an under sort of resourced setting where you don't have access to fish. So, so one last question, David. Um, you know, I, I think you, you made the point that you know, you were very clear when we're defining this tumor is you demanded a certain morphologic appearance. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because GLE-1 is expressed in other tumors as well and genetically altered. Can you speak a little bit about GLE-1 altered tumors? Uh, yeah, so this is this is an area that I'm very interested in and we're, we're actually actively uh, investigating right now uh, to try to determine histologic features that can predict malignant behavior in, in this class of tumors. So, um, the first tumor type that was described as having a GLE-1 alteration was so-called uh, GLE-1-altered pericytoma, and those also behaved in a benign fashion. Those were described by Christopher Fletcher and colleagues back in 2004. Um, then in 2018, there were these series of malignant tumors that harbored GLE-1 fusions and amplification. Uh, if you look at the pictures in those series, some of the, those tumors are also nested, but they tend to have more mitotic activity in nuclear tipia. Than, than this set of um, cases that we, that we studied in, in, the, in the series that I highlighted. Um, some of them also have different morphologic features. Some can be fascicular spindle cell sarcomas. Some are very overtly malignant looking with lots of mitotic activity and necrosis. So right now we're working to try to understand features that can predict outcomes in this class of tumors. And I think that's an open question right now. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, David. That, this was, sure. uh, this, this, this worked out so well. It, even beyond my expectations. So, you know, as, as you were going through those cases, I, I was, you know, I mean, obviously I've read your review, but I must say I did, things don't stick in my head very often. So um, I was just amazed by those, both the pictures and, and just the kind of work you do, you've been doing. Well, most, so congratulations say, and well, thank, thank you fantastic very much. work. I appreciate that. I have to say the most satisfying um, part of these types of projects is when you're actually first finding the cases and then you yes. recognize that they all look the same as one another and yeah, yeah, then you know, find yeah. something. So I always think the hunt is the most exciting bit. Yeah. And then after yeah. that, everything is sort of <laughs> just... The rest of it's hard. Yeah. yeah, heavy lifting beyond that. So. Yeah. All right, David. Well, thank you for the opportunity to of present course, these Of course. No, this was lovely. Yeah.